I think it's pretty safe to say that when it comes to Pokemon types, the Ice type doesn't exactly have the best reputation in the world. Like, when you look at other Pokemon types, you can kind of, like, get a feel for the thinking behind them and be like, yeah, I see where you were coming from with that, that was a good idea. Like, the Rock type was designed with numerous weaknesses, but a unique resistance to the game's most common attacking type. The Electric type only has a single weakness, but that weakness is made more impactful by not allowing Electric attacks to hit that type at all, and not typically giving Electric types the coverage to deal with that type. Grass has a huge number of weaknesses and types that resist its attacks, but the resistances that Grass does have are some of the best in the game. The thinking behind the Ice type seems to be pretty simple. It is really, really good offensively, but offers no defensive utility. And shit, for a type in your silly little Game Boy RPG, that, that makes sense. There's nothing really wrong with that on paper. The issue is that this concept just doesn't really translate super well to Pokemon because you can just run an Ice-type attack without actually being an Ice-type, making use of the great offensive capabilities of the type without actually having to deal with, like, you know, the main weakness the type was designed in mind with. Granted, non-Ice-type Pokémon running Ice-type attacks do miss out on the same type attack bonus, but these Pokémon are usually running these moves for super effective coverage, so it usually works out. As a result, when it comes to competitive Pokémon, you are highly incentivized to run Ice-type attacks, but not so much Ice-type Pokémon. And this is reflected in most generations where, again, Ice-type attacks are extremely common, but there are a very small handful of viable Ice-types. It's kind of like if you met the funniest meme ever, and then you woke up the next morning to find out that some 2 million follower account with a blue check mark got their hands on it and removed the watermark. Yeah, you, you hate to see it. Just as an example of how Ice-types really haven't been eating all that well and overused, in Generation 3, you had Regiice, who was overused for years to be fair, but was kind of just hanging on by a thread and ended up falling to UUBL on February 17th, 2021. Generation 4 overused has Mamoswine and Weavile, but Mamoswine is in that really awkward spot of overused by technicality, and while Weavile isn't, it maybe should be, because it's arguably even worse than Mamoswine. And then in Generation 5, you've got Curem Black, who, going off its stats, you wouldn't think is only as good as pretty solid and overused. But yeah, that's exactly what Curem Black is, and honestly, its ice typing is one of the biggest things holding it back from being, you know, really fucking good in overused, or even ubers. It can absolutely put in work, it's a pretty cool Pokémon, but it's got a lot going against it. Granted, there is one ice type Pokémon who's had quite a lot of success in overused, who I just kind of glossed over, but We'll get to them later, cause like, you know, spoilers and shit. And despite just how much the Ice type has going against it, Game Freak hasn't been all that nice to it over the years, all things considered. In Generation 2, Ice types had their best move nerfed, with Blizzard's accuracy going from 90% to 70%, they gained a brand new weakness in Steel, and Ice type attacks went from being resisted by two types to four types, now being resisted by Steel and Fire which kind of undermined the best thing about the type, being its offensive presence. Generation 3 introduced a new form of weather for Ice-type Pokémon to benefit from in Hail, but Generation 3 Hail is one of the most bizarrely flaccid mechanics in the entire series. It has so little to it, it's honestly kind of strange. All it offers is chip damage on all non-Ice-type Pokémon, which is honestly really hard to play around, like, why are you running multiple Ice-type Pokémon? And the only ability in the entire game that Hale interacts with is Cast Form's Forecast, which, like... Really now. Generation 4 buffed Hale by giving Blizzard perfect accuracy when Hale is up, and yeah, that's a Generation 4 thing. Generation 3 Hale really is nothing. And it introduced a Pokémon that could set Hale by switching in, that being Obama Snow. However, in the same generation that buffed Hale to kind of catch up with other types, Sandstorm was buffed to give rock types a 50% special defense boost when Sandstorm was up. And even then, speaking of Sandstorm, Pokemon like Tyranitar and Hippowdon, they're kind of really good alongside setting Sandstorm. Obama Snow isn't quite there. Out of all the Pokemon that set weather, Obama Snow was pretty fucking far behind. And to top it all off, not only has the Ice type just been bullied so much over the years, but as of Generation 9, it's also the least common type in the entire game. Which 
you know, considering we got a brand new fucking type only three generations ago, it's kind of wild. Speaking of Generation 9, though, even with my very, very limited Generation 9 knowledge, I am aware that things actually seem to be turning around for the Ice type in Generation 9. First off, the switch from hail to snow has been a huge improvement, no longer having to deal with that awkward chip damage and instead offering ice types a defense boost. And on top of that, there's just genuinely really good ice types like Chen Pao and Back Sack and Crack Scalibur. Learning about how ice types are making a bit of a comeback in Generation 9 is actually what kind of made me want to talk about ice types in Gen 1. Because believe it or not, the ice type in Gen 1 is actually remarkably solid. In Generation 1, Ice-type attacks are only resisted by water and ice, so their offensive presence is better than ever. And because of the absence of steel, they've only got three weaknesses. And in Generation 1, those weaknesses are really quite manageable. Fire and Fighting types in Generation 1 are Gen 1 Fire and Fighting types, so they're not exactly your biggest concern in the world. And while there are quite a lot of good Pokémon with Rock Slide, Ice-type Pokémon generally tend to match up quite well against them, even if Rock Slide does pose significant damage. Ice-type Pokémon in RBY are also one of the most solid in the game when it comes to tiering. As of right now, there are two overused Ice-type Pokémon, two under... Two of them are in underused, and one of them is currently on the underused ban list, and is genuinely decent in overused. So, yeah, all of the Ice-type Pokémon are doing quite well for themselves somewhere. And I do mean all of them, because interestingly enough, the Ice type in Generation 1 is the only type in the entire franchise to be possessed by only fully evolved Pokémon. Jinx, Lapras, and Articuno are one-stage Pokémon, and Cloyster and Dugong gain their Ice type upon evolving. Before that, they're just pure water. This is actually a creative choice by the RBY team, referencing the fact that if you leave a child out in the snow and ice, it will die. On top of featuring five genuinely solid Pokémon, there are five Ice-type attacks in RBY. Those being Aurora Beam, Ice Punch, Ice Beam, Blizzard, Haze, and... N mist What the fuck is Mist? So, yeah, if you're like me and had no idea Mist existed, let alone existed in Generation 1, I wouldn't exactly blame you. Uh, it protects the user from having their stats lowered, and unlike Generation 3 onwards where it just lasts for 5 turns, it lasts as long as the user is switched in, so kind of similar to how Reflect works in Generation 1. Mist is learned by 4 Pokémon, those being Lapras, Articuno, Vaporeon, and Mewtwo. And Mewtwo learning the move seems kind of interesting, you'd think it could actually make use of it, knowing how, you know, Mewtwo mirrors and Ubers are the way they are. Unfortunately, there's one key downside to Mist that just completely renders the move useless, and is probably the reason why you may not have ever heard of it in RBY. The big issue with Mist is that it only protects you from moves that directly lower your stats, such as Tail Whip or Screech. It doesn't protect you from the secondary effects of moves that lower your stats. Notably, the 33% chance that Psychic will drop your special. When it comes to that, Mist is totally useless, and really, that completely destroys the move. It's honestly a real shame that the move is like this, because I could see Mewtwo and Ubers actually getting use out of this move if it actually protected you from Psychic Special Drops, but it is the way it is, and that way is completely useless. Man, thanks Game Freak, you, you gave us this, but you couldn't have given the most common type in the game an attack with more than 65 base power. No, that's that's fine, that's fine. I, I, I see how it is. Your vision and all that. From one weird fucked up status move to another, we've now got Haze. Haze resets the stat changes for both Pokémon on the field, and it also removes the effects of things like Leech Seed, Disable, and Reflect. Where things get a bit fucky though, is how Haze interacts with status conditions. For both Pokémon, it will remove things like the stat drops from Paralysis and Burn, and it also resets the Toxic counter for zero for both Pokémon. However, Haze will only outright remove the opponent's status condition. How generous. Now, while Haze is pretty weird and fucked up, you could make the argument that I shouldn't even be talking about it at all. Because believe it or not, Haze is the only Ice-type move that isn't actually learned by any Ice-type Pokémon. The only Pokémon that get Haze are the Golbat line, the Weezing line, and once again, Vaporeon 
who interestingly enough, despite not being an ice type, actually learns more ice type attacks than any other Pokemon, with five, only missing out on Ice Punch. This is probably because it uses a combination of Mist, Haze, and Blizzard to hide from all the really fucking weird people who keep making that one fucking joke. Moving on to the actual attacks that do damage, we first got Aurora Beam, which is the weakest ice type attack at 65 base power. Now, Aurora Beam is unique in that it's the only ice type attack where the secondary effect isn't a 10% freeze chance, but a 33% chance to lower the opponent's attack by one stage. This is notable for being exclusively bad. Uh, you've probably figured this out if you've ever played RBY for some extended amount of time, but Freeze is kind of really good in Generation 1. A Pokemon will never thaw out on its own, so getting frozen is essentially a KO. The only ways to get thawed out are to get hit by a Fire-type move other than Fire Spin, which is pretty rare and overused, or for the opponent to use Haze, which just really is not an overused. There's a reason that Freeze Claws is a thing. Freeze is absolutely incredible. And throwing that away for what is essentially Intimidate with extra steps is just not worth it at all. Aurora Beam is only learned by Cloyster, Dugong, and Vaporeon, and I can assure you, none of them are ever remotely tempted to pick it. Next up we have Ice Punch, which since this is before the physical special split, is literally just a weaker Ice Beam that's only learned by two Pokemon, those being Hitmonchan and Jinx. It does have more PP than Ice Beam, but this is realistically never coming into play. Now, Ice Punch might seem like a decent coverage option for Hitmonchan in 7U, but it's severely held back by Hitmonchan's pathetic special stat of 35. Despite hitting super effectively, it's outdamaged by Body Slam against Golbat and Ivysaur, and against Rhyhorn, it is severely outdamaged by Submission. Although, I guess it still has some use in that matchup in situations where you don't want to risk the recoil damage or Submission's shaky accuracy. Jinx, on the other hand, has absolutely zero use for Ice Punch. The only times you're ever going to see it are in Stadium Rentals, where it's just stuck with Ice Punch instead of something better, or if Jinx is running it just to flex. Like, Jinx's fourth move isn't super important, so like, I don't know, if the idea of punching a low health executor is cool to you, shit, I don't know, I guess you could do that. Finally getting onto the good shit, Ice Beam is a very consistent and potentially incredibly rewarding attack that is mainly used on Pokemon that appreciate its higher PP compared to Blizzard. Specifically Pokemon that would want to, you know, stick around for long periods of time and hopefully fish for a freeze. Pokemon like Chansey, Reflect Snorlax, Mewtwo, or Porygon. Articuno will also occasionally run Ice Beam alongside Blizzard, and I believe it's the only Pokemon that ever considers doing so. But while there is some merit to that, it's more so just a byproduct of Articuno having a very, very limited move pool. And even so, it's not the most common option. People generally prefer Double Edge over Ice Beam. And lastly, we've got THE Ice type attack, and that's Blizzard. Blizzard in RBY is one of the most iconic attacks in Pokemon history, and that's for a very good reason. It is absolutely ludicrous. Rocking a massive 120 base power, a 10% freeze chance in the generation where freeze was at its most terrifying, and still having 90% accuracy for some reason? You know? Pretty fucking good. There's not really any point in me, like, pinpointing specific uses of Blizzard, because it's used by a massive amount of Pokémon in a huge number of scenarios. It's just one of the most generally applicable moves in all of Pokémon. It, it, it would be like me trying to pinpoint specific uses of Body Slam or Hyper Beam in RBY. It's just good. And in fact, it used to be even better because in the Japanese releases of Red and Green, Blizzard had a 30% chance to freeze the opponent instead of a 10% chance. Which, on top of just being, you know, a, a crime against humanity, that's obvious in itself, is just really funny that they thought that was okay in the same generation where Thunder is 70% accurate and only has a 10% chance to paralyze. It, I don't know, I just think that's neat. Now, with all that out the way, it would seem to me that you're over 14 minutes into Ice-type Pokémon in RBY, and you're probably fucking itching to actually hear about some Ice-type Pokémon. So, let's get into it. First things first, we have Dewgong, who is probably most well known for Lorelei's Dewgong and the whole infinite battle shtick that it can cause. And, 
In hindsight, Dugong was probably compensating for something with that, because I don't really think there's too many people rushing to use Dugong in battles of their own. Water and Ice is definitely not the most interesting typing in the world, its stats are really quite unremarkable, and it's got a move pool that just screams, I'm a water type that you've forgotten about. Now, despite the fact that Dugong isn't the most memorable Pokemon in the world, it's actually had a fairly interesting competitive history in RBY. When Yu Yu was the lowest tier in RBY, Dugong was Shocker, Yu Yu, and when Enyu was introduced, it dropped to Enyu. However, Dugong actually rose back up to Yu Yu on August 2nd, 2021, leaving Enyu and every tier below it with no ice types whatsoever, which is kind of interesting. Nu, Pu, and I'm pretty sure Zu feature every other type in the game, so I don't know. I thought that was neat. Now, when Dugong was in Never Used, it was a legitimately great Pokemon. Now, its ice typing did mean it didn't resist fire, which in Nu was actually a bit of a problem considering the prevalence of Charizard and Moltres, but its ice typing was very useful in other ways. It gave it a great matchup against other water types. Namely because its ice type made it immune to freeze from the likes of Blastoise, for example, which is a big deal. And another good thing about that ice type is, you know, Stab Blizzard. The only Stab Blizzard, even. It did drop off a bit when Poliwrath and especially Raichu were in the tier, but once both of those Pokemon were banned, it returned to its former glory for a bit, before eventually rising to Yu Yu. Now, when Dugong rose to Yu Yu, it was generally on the lower end of Yu Yu viability, but it did definitely have a niche in the tier and was an important part of the metagame nonetheless. It generally faced competition from other bulky water types like Vaporeon, who had significantly higher bulk, or Omastar, who had a unique normal resistance. The biggest thing holding Dugong back compared to these two Pokemon was the lower bulk. It really just didn't have the same staying power as those two, so it struggled to kind of have a consistent presence throughout a game, which was an issue to be sure, but it did have some very unique traits of its own that allowed it to stand out. For a start, the ice typing. On top of Stab Blizzard being fantastic, allowing it to two hit KO Kangaskhan and one hit KO Dragonite, its ice typing also made it immune to getting frozen which on top of allowing it to match up well against other water types, gave it a fantastic matchup versus Articuno, who, you know, we'll touch on them later, but yeah, they're pretty fucking good Pokemon in Yu Yu. On top of that, Dugong is also faster than Vaporeon and Omastar, notably getting the jump on Hypno back when it was in the tier, which is pretty important. However, speaking of Pokemon that were in Yu Yu and now kind of aren't, uh, yeah, you can probably imagine that when Lapras was in Yu Yu, Dugong was kind of not eating at all. So first of all, you have the issue of why would I use Dugong over Lapras? Uh, and the answer was you didn't. Uh, that 10 extra speed and access to headbutt is only going to get you so far. Uh, secondly, when Lapras was in UU, Articuno was much worse off. So if Articuno is not doing well, and this new better version of you that showed up is a great answer to Articuno, then you can imagine that the OG answer to Articuno is also probably not doing so well. No! Now, there's no denying that Lapras being in the tier was a bit of a dark time for Dugong, but at the end of the day, Lapras isn't in RBYUU anymore. And as a result, Dugong is not only good again, but it's actually better than it was before Lapras was introduced to the tier arguably being the tier's second most important water type after Tentacruel. Articuno is currently one of RBYUU's most important Pokemon, and as a result, Dugong's ability to answer it is extremely important. Now, with that being said, there's a reason I've been calling Dugong an answer to Articuno and not like a check or a counter. Yes, it has a 4 times ice resistance, good bulk, and an immunity to freeze, but it doesn't really threaten Articuno all that hard in return, and that can be a bit of an issue. The most Dugong can really threaten Articuno with is Blizzard, which is only a 4 hit KO, or Body Slam Paralysis, which, you know, is good if you get it, but it's not the most reliable thing in the world, and without the Paralysis, Body Slam's damage on its own is fairly unremarkable. And Articuno can absolutely come out on top, like, double-edged crits do add up, and they're not all that unlikely, it's a 1 in 6 chance, so yeah, it's an answer, but not a concrete one. Still, even with that, Dugong is currently a very important Pokemon in RBYUU, 
And it's nice to see such a usually oft-forgotten Pokémon doing fairly well for itself. Next up, we have the other UU Ice type, that being Articuno. Now, Articuno has been a staple of UU for years, but it actually has a surprising history and overused as well, going back as far as June 9th, 2010. Now, Articuno being overused back in the day wasn't exactly unwarranted. It did have a few genuinely excellent matchups like Exeggutor, Rhydon, Golem, and Blizzard's damage output was genuinely obscene. It's tied with Moltres' Fire Blast and, I guess, Zapdos Thunder for the single strongest unboosted special attack in the game. Now, on the other hand, Articuno's issues were numerous and pretty severe. For a start, Pokémon like Starmie that could take its Blizzards well and outspeed it gave it a lot of trouble, because Articuno's move pool was very limited and its speed tier was only decent. Starmie, for example, could threaten Paralysis or even a 3-hit KO with Thunderbolt. The reliance on Blizzard also meant that it seriously struggled to break past Pokémon like Chansey, Lapras, and Cloyster. This combined with just general changes in the metagame like Starmie rising in usage meant that Articuno just couldn't really hold on to overused and ended up dropping to UU, where luckily for it, it ended up being one of the best Pokémon around. And in fairness to Articuno, while it has dropped from OU to UU, that doesn't automatically make it bad in overused. It's currently at C rank on the viability rankings, which, all things considered, is pretty respectable. Now, with the exception of when Lapras was in the tier, Articuno has been one of the most consistently excellent UU Pokémon around, and it generally runs a very similar set to the one that it does in overused, consisting of Blizzard, Hyper Beam, Agility, and then a more flexible fourth move, although the standard pick is Double Edge. The power of Articuno's Blizzard is even more monstrous in UU than it was in Overused, two-hit KOing very important Pokémon like Kangaskhan and Persian, and even one-hit KOing Pokémon like Dragonite or Dugtrio. And even then, Pokémon that resist Blizzard with the exception of Dugong have to worry about potentially getting frozen. Granted, outside of Freeze, Articuno really has the relatively weak Double Edge or Hyper Beam to muscle through its resists or specially bulky Pokémon, but even then, they have to worry about the possibility of a crit double edge, or hyper beam even. It's a 1 in 6 chance for Articuno, so it is something you have to take into account for sure. On top of that, Articuno's speed tier isn't amazing, all things considered. Notably, it's outsped by Kangaskhan and Dugtrio, who both threaten a 2 hit KO with Rock Slide, and it's also outsped by Tentacruel, who can bully it with Rap, and isn't super scared about what happens to it if it misses a rap. However, while on its own Articuno speed isn't incredible, there is always the risk that it uses agility to patch it up, and in that scenario, Articuno is very, very hard to stop. Overall, Articuno is a very powerful and potentially pretty volatile threat in RBYUU that really doesn't have any concrete counters. There are Pokémon that can outspeed and 2-hit KO it, until Articuno gets an agility up or gets some paralysis support from its team. There are Pokémon that take minimal damage from Blizzard, but shudder at the thought of getting frozen or getting worn down by multiple crit body edges. Body edges? Double edge! Just fucking inventing moves now, Jesus. Obviously, you won't always be able to get an agility up or crit your way through anything that takes Blizzard well, but there's a very good reason that Articuno is as good as it is. And unless something crazy happens, like Lapras comes back or Jolteon gets really down on its luck and ends up paying Yu Yu a visit, I don't think that's ever going to change. Articuno will probably continue to be fantastic in Yu Yu. Next up, we've got a stupid asshole meanie head, and that's Lampras. So listen, we've talked about this a lot at this point, but here's just a quick recap of the Lapras timeline. Lapras was overused for over a decade. It was a good Pokémon, but it was definitely on the lower end of overused viability. On June 23rd, 2022, Lampras dropped to UU, but was immediately quick banned. Then it dropped for real on November 30th, 2022, following the sleep ban, and then it eventually got banned from UU, May 15th, 2023. So listen, I'm only going to talk about OU Lampras for this part of the video. I think I've brought up Lampras dropping to UU like three videos in a row, and like, we've just been talking about how it bullied the shit out of Dugong and Articuno. Let, let, let's just focus on the place where you can actually use it, okay? It's, Yu Yu Lapras is behind us now. Nowadays in RBY Overused, Lapras generally runs a set of Blizzard, Thunderbolt, Sing, and then either Hyper Beam or Body Slam. Confuse Ray is also an option, and it was more of a staple in like, the mid-2010s, but 
Nowadays, it's a little bit silly, and you don't see it all that much. Seeing is generally preferred. Overused Lapras is honestly a little bit tricky to talk about, because it's always had this reputation of being a bit of a jack-of-all-trades master of none Pokémon. Like, it's pretty powerful, but there's definitely stronger stuff in the tier. It's pretty bulky, but it lacks reliable recovery outside of rest. It's got quite a lot of good matchups, but it can usually do well in, like, one, and then find itself not healthy enough to really tackle another. And it does have some utility in Sing, but obviously, Sing isn't the most reliable thing in the world. Lapras is one of the better answers in the tier to Tauros and Snorlax, taking fairly minimal damage from their safer options like Body Slam and especially Blizzard or Ice Beam, and Lapras can threaten them in return with either Sleep or a powerful Blizzard of its own. Although, unfortunately, just not quite as powerful as you'd like, with the chance to two-hit KO Tauros being a notoriously irritating 27.7%. Hmm. It's got other more favourable matchups like Executor, Rhydon, and Cloyster, and it can put in work against the likes of Starmie, but admittedly in that matchup you'd really like Paralysis support. Things like Thunder Wave or Psychic Special Drops can turn that matchup a bit sour pretty fast. Unsurprisingly, it matches up very poorly against the tier's Electric types, and while Chansey can't do a whole lot to it in return, Lapras is basically completely walled by Chansey, especially if it's paralyzed, because that takes away the option of using Sing. Like I said earlier, Lapras does have a lot of matchups where it can do well, but the middling speed and lack of recovery mean that it really struggles to kind of do that multiple times in one game. Like, yeah, let's say you beat a Tauros one-on-one, -on -one, good for you, but what now? Right? Like, you're a Pokémon with base 60 speed that's probably at, like, 30% on a good day. I don't know, it's a bit dicey. Lapras is a good Pokémon. It's solid, it's decent, that's why it's in C rank on the current viability rankings. And admittedly, the electrics aren't doing super well at the moment, so maybe it'll go up over time, but we'll see. At the end of the day, Lapras is a decent Pokémon in RBY Overused. It does a lot of things quite well, but it kind of struggles to put all of it together in practice. Again, jack of all trades, master of none. It's distinctly below the other overused ice types, but it's got a clear niche within the tier, and is not a bad Pokémon by any means. Now, we're finally at the two ice type Pokémon in RBY that are actually ranked in overused. And speaking of where they're ranked, I'd like to touch on that for a second. See, so far I've been talking about these Pokémon in order of viability, but the thing with Jinx and Cloyster is that they're kind of really close together. If you're going off the current viability rankings, then Cloyster is ranked at 10th, and Jinx is ranked at 11th. But I do think it's worth mentioning that I've seen a lot of very talented players rank Jinx above Cloyster, and that's totally valid. I'm still going to talk about Jinx first, but I figured it was at least worth pointing out. There are some very talented players putting Jinx over Cloyster, and some very talented players putting Cloyster over Jinx. Either way works, there's a case for both of them, just, just putting it out there. So, next up we have Jinx. Jinx is a Pokémon that's been through quite a lot, and it's clearly someone at Game Freak's favourite Pokémon going off that one time they squeezed everything they could out of the Nintendo 64 to give it the most hyper-realistic feat that you can get with 4 megabytes of RAM. I know I've brought this up before, but I don't care. I'm not letting Game Freak sweep this one under the rug. Anyways, Jinx is most well known for its use as a lead, mainly because it's the fastest Pokémon in the game with access to a 75% accurate sleep-inducing move in Lovely Kiss. Alongside Lovely Kiss, it generally runs Blizzard and Psychic for powerful stab and potential utility in Freeze and Psychic Special Drops, and then the fourth move is kind of fillery, but the most common option is Rest. Now, as a lead, Jinx generally beats slower sleep-inducing leads like Sing Chansey or Exeggutor, but it generally loses to Gengar, and it hates getting paralyzed so early into a game by the likes of Alakazam or Starmie. Now, realistically, it's not as clear-cut as this. RBY's lead metagame is so much more than just this Pokémon beats this Pokémon, but it loses to this Pokémon and such, you know? Gengar is a pretty rough matchup, but pressuring Thunder Wave out of the likes of Starmie and Alakazam is something you can absolutely play around, as is something like Chansey or Exeggutor switching out because they know a sleep-inducing move is coming. There's a lot more to it than just this beats this. Now, I think Jinx tends to get a bit of a bad reputation as a Pokémon that puts something to sleep, gets paralyzed in the process, and then ends up contributing very little. Maybe getting a chance or two to fish for a freeze, or like, attempting to use rest and then getting beaten up by Tauros. 
However, if you do manage to preserve Jinx for later in the game, it can actually put quite a lot of work in. Notably, Jinx has a good speed tier, it's immune to being frozen, and it has pretty good damage output, notably two hit KOing Executor and Zapdos, and having a good chance to three hit KO Snorlax. Jinx does have a lot of good traits outside of sleep, it's just that you do kind of have to take them with a grain of salt, because making use of them assumes that you've managed to, like, put something to sleep, and then still have a healthy Jinx in the mid to late game, which admittedly is quite difficult. It's still entirely possible for the age-old scenario of Jinx puts thing to sleep and then gets fucked over in one of many ways to happen, but still, that might be enough. It's just, you know, you, you do like to get more out of it. For a start, Jinx is pretty fast at 95 speed, but there are plenty of very threatening Pokémon that outspeed it, like Gengar, Tauros, Starmie, and Alakazam. Outside of the threat of sleep or freeze, it generally struggles to threaten specially bulky Pokémon like Starmie, Slowbro, Alakazam, Chansey. All of these Pokémon take its hits quite well, and they all threaten it with paralysis in return. There's also the very obvious issue of Jinx being incredibly frail on the physical side. Uh, if you're brave enough, you can kind of use this to your advantage with Counter maybe, but it's a little bit silly, it's very risky. Overall, this is a net negative, for sure. Notably, Tauros has incredibly good odds of just outright 2 hit KOing you with Body Slam, and you are massively likely to just get outright 1 hit KO'd by a Gengar Explosion. Another issue with Jinx, unlike some other leads, is that while it's fantastic at inflicting other Pokémon with sleep, it's not all that great of a sleep absorber itself. The most obvious issue is Jinx's incredibly low bulk, which means that if you do get put to sleep, you are very, very vulnerable to being beaten the fuck out of while you are asleep, more so than the likes of Starmie, for example. And also, even if you do wake up, you have to rely on rest to get back up to full health, unlike Alakazam and Starmie, who have Recover, or Gengar, who's just like, okay, nice argument, idiot, but what if I just fucking blew up? Jinx is a Pokémon that consistently does one thing incredibly well, but getting value out of it outside of that one thing is where things get a little bit dicey. There are very talented players who can pull it off, and I think that's a big factor in why some people rate it so highly, but I can definitely see both sides of the argument. Personally, I think it's super exciting to see Jinx optimized more, and see good players get all the mileage they possibly can out of it, but at the same time, I do absolutely understand why some people are hesitant about using it, and while maybe its bad reputation isn't entirely deserved, there is a reason it exists to begin with. I'm curious how things turn out for Jinx in the future, but for now, it's pretty damn good. Lastly, we've got Cloyster. And I did mention earlier when I was touching on Ice-type Pokémon that have had an impact on Overuse that I left someone out. Uh, this is it. Cloyster's done quite a lot in Overuse, actually, it's pretty cool. In Generation 2, not only is Cloyster overused, but it's actually ranked at 3rd in the tier. In Generation 3, it's overused again, and in Generation 5, it's overused, although admittedly it did need a lot of under-the-counter help, but that's neither here nor there. On top of being one of the few Ice-type Pokémon that has been consistently good in multiple generations of overused, uh, Cloyster's also notable because it used to be Plague Von Karma's favorite Pokémon. She actually has an entire video on Cloyster that I would highly recommend checking out if you're more interested about the Pokémon's history in RBY. Uh, I'm really only going to be focusing on what it's doing right now, uh, I don't really have the same relationship with Cloyster. I don't want to pry into the private life of the Clamp God. You know how it is. Cloyster is currently the highest ranked Ice type in all of RBY, at 10th in Overused. And it hasn't changed a whole lot in recent years, but it's still a remarkably solid and very unique Mon in the tier. Cloyster's most defining tools in Overused are arguably Clamp and its very high physical bulk. Clamp is a pretty loaded move with a lot of really cool applications outside of just, you know, the whole shtick of wrap the other guy to death and hope you don't miss. I, I promise there's more to it than that. Arguably the most notable thing about Clamp is its ability to offer free switches. If you hit the opponent with Clamp and switch out, the opponent's Pokémon will be unable to attack as your Pokémon come in. It will be able to switch, but if both Pokémon switch, then obviously your Mon got in safely regardless, so still a win-win. Admittedly, Cloyster does have a lot of tricky matchups, but against slower or paralyzed opponents, Clamp gives it a great opportunity to play around them by bringing in a teammate safely who would be better suited to the matchup, but might not safely be able to switch in. It's also worth mentioning that out of all the partial trapping moves, Clamp is the strongest, with 35 base power, which is backed up by same type attack bonus and decent special. 
The damage isn't crazy, but it does add up, and even with Clamp's shaky 75% accuracy, it makes using it repeatedly to try and chip the opponent into a range where you can take them out with the likes of Blizzard a pretty valid option. Cloyster's excellent physical bulk makes it one of the absolute best answers to Tauros and Snorlax in the tier. And I don't know if you heard, but they're like kinda really fucking good, so that's like important. Body Slam from either of them is only a 5 hit KO, and while unfortunately you're not immune to paralysis from Body Slam like normal types, you are at the very least immune to freeze, so you can use rest to remain healthy. Blizzard is also fantastic for pressuring these two. Obviously there's the threat of freeze, but on top of that, Blizzard is a 3 hit KO on Tauros, and while your chances of 3 hit KOing Lax are slim, Lax is slower than you, so you can also bully it with Clamp to kinda chip away at it in combination with Blizzard. Explosion is also a phenomenal tool that allows Cloyster to make mons that would otherwise gladly switch into it think twice, or make good situations out of bad matchups by opening holes in the opponent's team that the rest of your teammates can take advantage of. Cloyster's explosion outright one-hit KOs the likes of Chansey, Alakazam, and Jinx, and it can put a massive dent in the vast majority of the tier. Now, unfortunately, while Cloyster absolutely can make some of its bad matchups work, it's got quite a few of them because it's got some pretty key fundamental issues. First of all, Cloyster has some pretty noticeable issues when it comes to PP. Blizzard is usually the only attack that Cloyster runs that doesn't have some kind of noticeable downside. Like, Clamp is more of a utility than an attack, and not only does it have shaky accuracy, but you can only, you know, traditionally spam it against slower Pokémon or paralyzed mons. You'll occasionally see Cloyster swap Rest out for Hyper Beam, but yeah, Hyper Beam isn't exactly spammable, it's more of a finisher than anything else. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you've noticed, yet you can exactly spam Explosion. Yeah, I'm shocker, I know. Potentially running out of blizzards is actually a pretty real issue for Cloyster, and that can be problematic when you really want to save them to try and, like, pressure a Tauros or Snorlax in the late game. You could swap it out for Ice Beam, but I wouldn't really recommend it. The loss in power is very noticeable. Outside of Explosion, Cloyster really does struggle to put a dent in opposing water types like Starmie or Slowbro, or especially bulky Pokémon like Chansey. Not only do these mons often threaten paralysis, which can ruin your utility or force you to use rest or explosion much earlier than you'd like, but they can actually put a pretty severe dent in you with Thunderbolt or Psychic. Cloyster's special bulk isn't all that amazing thanks to its very mediocre HP stat. In these matchups, your best options are usually just to blow up, or if you outspeed, to use Clamp and just try and bring something else in safely. And even then, that's not foolproof. There's a lot wrong with a predictable explosion, and again, Clamp has pretty shaky accuracy. Although, unlike the mons I just mentioned, it hates switching into Blizzard, Gengar can give you a ton of trouble. It outspeeds and threatens to two-hit KO you with Thunderbolt, while also being immune to explosion. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Jinx takes explosion about as well as the fucking dinosaurs did 65 million years ago, but it really isn't afraid of anything else that Cloyster can throw at it. They're not exactly doing the best right now, but still, the electrics give you a lot of trouble, and there's also the risk that Tauros can throw a massive wrench in your plan and swap Earthquake out for Thunderbolt. This is rare, but it's a huge issue for Cloyster if it does happen. While Body Slam was only a 5-hit KO, Tauros can cleanly 3-hit KO you with Thunderbolt, and while Thunder is a 2-hit KO, if the opponent's Tauros is running Thunder, you should be less concerned about losing a children's video game from 25 years ago and more concerned about contacting the authorities. They're just built different. So at the end of the day, there's a lot that gives Cloyster trouble, but it's still the Clamp God. It is an excellent Pokémon in RBY overuse thanks to its uniquely brilliant strengths. It's not an airtight answer, but it is one of the best answers to the tier's two best Pokémon in Tauros and Snorlax. Clamp is an incredibly unique and pretty flexible tool that enables a lot of really cool plays, and yes, there's a lot of matchups where you can't do a whole lot other than blow up, but like, it's better to be able to blow up in a bad matchup than not. So, there you have it. That is a look at every single Ice-type Pokémon in RBY. And, shit man, for a type that has just such a terrible reputation, a type that has been through so much over the years, it's really nice to see it do well for itself, not just anywhere, but in the generation where it was introduced. Well, that's what I would say, uh, but unfortunately it turns out I've actually been lying to you this entire video, because I just found out about 20 minutes ago that Cloyster has a 0.1% chance to be 3-hit KO'd 
by Machamp's low kick. So, kind of turns out that every ice type sucks ass, actually. Sorry about that. Thank you.